All right, greetings everyone and welcome to the fifth event of APARC's Winter 2022 webinar series titled New Frontiers, Technology, Politics and Society in the Asia Pacific. Uh, my name is Kyotero Tsutsui and I'm Deputy Director of the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. This webinar series focuses on technology and its political and social impact in Asia and examines how advanced technologies are transforming social orders and international politics. The series covers a wide range of pressing issues from great power contests to global trade and supply chains, and from rising digital authoritarianism to climate change solutions and digital healthcare. Our stellar guest speaker lineup that features leading academics and experts in their fields has examined the interconnections between technology and policy relevant issues, such as cybersecurity on the Korean Peninsula, state of democracy in India, and US-China competition in technological innovation. Each event is led by one of APARC's research programs. And today we are pleased to host a discussion on the digital transformation of Southeast Asia, led by our Southeast Asia program. So without any further ado, let me turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Don Emerson, Director of the Southeast Asia Program at APARC, who will moderate the discussion. So Don, please take it away. Thank you, Keo. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Southeast Asia Program at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University, I'm delighted to welcome you to a webinar on the digital transformation of Southeast Asia, issues and prospects. As my colleague Keo just noted, today's event is one of a series put together by our center under the title New Frontiers, Technology, Politics, and Society in the Asia Pacific. I'm especially pleased that we have two outstanding qualified scholars to walk us through digital transformation in Southeast Asia. And the word transformation is important because I don't think this is an underestimation of the importance of the impact of technology what we choose to call high technology in Southeast Asia. To save time for presentations and discussions, I will introduce the speakers far more briefly than they deserve. Hong Le Tu, a senior analyst with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, co-wrote a just published study of our topic entitled Digital Southeast Asia. She is a prolific and influential observer of security and diplomacy issues in the region, who has held positions in universities and think tanks, including the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. And I was amazed to learn that she speaks five languages and has published in four of them, <laughs> which is quite amazing. Alina Noor is no less impressive. While doing double duty, as the Asia Society Policy Institute in DC, uh, as its Director for Political Security Affairs, as well as its Deputy Director, she has launched just recently a podcast entitled Between the Binary Tech and the Global South, which explores how technology interacts with socioeconomic and political variables in Southeast Asia and in other developing regions. A member of the Global Commission on the stability of cyberspace, she has held key positions in policy institutes, including the Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Kuala Lumpur. Taken together, I might add, our two speakers have four advanced degrees. So that's the introduction. And therefore, I'd like to turn it over first to um, Dr. Latou, and then following her to uh, Alina Noor for brief presentations on our topic, followed by a little bit of interaction between the two of them and myself, followed by the Q&A. And you can use the Q&A option at the bottom of your, of the, your screen for that particular purpose. Okay, thanks. Um, Dr. Letou, over to you. Thank you, Don. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to, to join you um, uh, at the webinar series. It's great to be with Elena um, on this talk. And I wish I could be in California myself right now, but um, this is what technology enables us. And this is what we are going to talk about, the technology, the role of technology uh, very fastly um, in a very fastly changing environment in Southeast Asia. 
let me start with a little bit of context, um, how just to showcase how diverse and uneven um, the region is. And uh, we should always take that into consideration talking about any aspect um, uh, of technology, uh, digital uh, development, as well as the future of digital order is, uh, if, uh, if we want to uh, look at that way. So let me start with a more geopolitical um, context, uh, how the technology is um, shaping uh, also in terms of uh, uh, political and national security choices in Southeast Asia before I move to, to the opportunities that this rapid digital transformation uh, offers. So um, oftentimes, Southeast Asia, when we talk about um, great power competition, you, you see that particularly from US or, or China or other external uh, countries is seen as the arena of great power competition. And I think that was very uh, visible, but very apparent when uh, the Huawei ban was announced and it was very interesting to see how that was um, received, responded to, or acted upon in Southeast Asia. And you can, that is a really good example to showcase the diversity of choices um, that are being shaped in the region and, and likely uh, uh, making the digital and technological future of Southeast Asia even more uneven. Um, so I think, uh, first of all, the Huawei ban was uh, certainly a political uh, decision in, in, in the particularly in, in the shaping in, and um, building the 5G network. In Southeast Asia, we saw an array of choices uh, and approaches to that ban. Some of uh, countries have opted not to use Huawei in the 5G networks um, and have uh, chosen, for example, um, Ericsson and Nokia in partnership with their own uh, telecoms um, for the sake of, of, of course, with consideration um, of national security argument. Uh, but none of them have uh, chose to ban Huawei officially. Uh, Huawei is still, uh, of course, an, a, a commercial uh, actor and uh, uh, still pre present. Just because Huawei and other Chinese uh, digital um, technological companies have had inroads in the region for the past 20, 30 years or more. So, so they will, Chinese companies um, and including tech companies will remain very entrenched in the developing Southeast Asian uh, tech ecosystem. So that's the first point. The second point um, for me, me to stress that even the countries that have cho chosen not to use Huawei in their 5G networks, such as Vietnam and Singapore, they are, uh, it's not, um, uh, a blanket ban and they are continuing to engage and have other Chinese uh, tech companies present in, the re in their ecosystem. For example, Singapore is a hub, regional hub for many uh, other companies, including uh, Tencent, or, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, and through, through Singapore's regional hub, uh, the Chinese companies will have a really uh, good access to the rest of Southeast Asia. Now, in my studies, when I did that um, a few years back, uh, of course, there are com company, there are countries that have decided to go with Huawei, notably um, Philippines uh, and Cambodia were the first of more embracing ones. Um, but I think uh, the key uh, conclusion I've arrived to is whether we talk about 5G, Huawei, and other technologies for the region to consider options and choices, there are three factors that will, are recurring, whether we're talking about tech, infrastructure, or other um, aspects. And those are uh, availability, affordability, uh, accessibility, and affordability, right? Um, it has to be available for those countries. The countries don't have, for example, sanctions or other political um, uh, agenda that simply the technology and, and service is not available to them. It must be uh, accessible. It has great coverage and accessible to the population there. And uh, affordability is a big factor for uh, developing markets, um, which most of Southeast Asia are uh, excluding, of course, Singapore. So we have to remember about that. The Huawei ban was a very political um, issue and also, of course, national security. But even with that, I think um, the Southeast Asian countries were very sensitive and um, careful about uh, U.S. announced um, ban, which were supported by a number of uh, 
close allies uh, outside of the region because uh, US uh, former allies, Thailand and Philippines notably didn't uh, embrace that ban either. So that's the, the that's a key issue in, in um, dictating for all Southeast Asian individual countries uh, in their uh, in their choices because tech when we talk about tech it's, it's uh, ultimately where market meets the states right that when market and state clashes it, their interest clashes and it's it's a, a tough a, a tough call but it is certainly not an even and straightforward um, uh, decision. It's it's not going to be one or two decision. It's an ongoing process. So we had we are seeing seeing um, a really complex network of different decision, different networks, different usage in, in Southeast Asia. And I can't imagine in in within ASEAN countries uh, that are completely mutually exclusive because in that way they can't they wouldn't be able to talk to each other in the first place. Uh, so Southeast Asia can't afford to be that uh, discriminatory in, in that regard. And I think mm, it, another point I wanted to stress is that China will have upper hand in Southeast Asia regardless because it considered Southeast Asia as a priority market. Um, it has it knows the values of Southeast Asia. It's first always first you know trial before it go. China goes more global. It goes you know directly regional to the neighboring Southeast Asia, and that was the case with Belt and Road Initiative infrastructure projects, and that is was the case also with the, uh, technological uh, companies um, in the in the region. So uh, with the U.S., uh, there are. Two distinct act, uh, sets of actors, right? There are state actors where we constantly have to remind US government that Southeast Asia. There is this such region, it is important, it is a viable market, it is a growing market. And of course, there are private companies that know and are dri driven by their own market interests and need no explanation as such, but not always align uh, directly with uh, the US government interests. So there, there are uh, discrepancies uh, there too. Uh, but I think uh, China will play, continue to play a very critical role in shaping digital order um, uh, in Southeast Asia, just because it is there, it's very entrenched, it, it is a constant actor and is imagined in, in many uh, ways, whether it's, uh, we're talking about uh, data, but or uh, you know, individual use of apps of choices um, like that. Now, um, <laughs> these are geopolitical contexts. I wanted to shift a little bit to more uh, of the recent development since the pandemic, which is more uh, gives a little bit more optimistic outlook with more of a sort of bottom up approach because the choice of Huawei, but, uh, as I um, showed in the example, is very much still a, 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 a top down approach because it considers national interest. This, the digital transformation is happening big time in Southeast Asia and has been happening before the pandemic. Uh, it is now even more so we get accelerated by pandemic, social distancing, and inability to perform regular activities uh, when the lockdowns happen. A lot of education and work has moved on to the online platform. Um, and Southeast Asia is a young population, a population of rapidly urbanizing and very enthusiastic embracing technology, more so uh, than average uh, of the globe uh, 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 enthusiasm about tech. And this is the region where digital uh, economy is predicted that within these 2020s will reach trillions uh, of worth. Uh, trillion dollars of worth. So we are in the time when they call it a uh, trillion twenties for Southeast Asian digital economy market. So there is a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, of uh, hope and opportunities, a boom of um, innovation startup, and as well as unicorns and uh, mushrooming uh, in a number of Southeast Asian countries. Um, the problem is, how, however, not everyone have had access 
to internet or connection to be able to carry on with the online learning um, or performing uh, economic activities. Not everyone has had access to internet. Of course, it is a massive skew towards more urbanized population, leaving behind those in remote areas where infrastructure has not reached or you know, in, in infrastructure is not reliable or secure. So that's, it, it's going to be a big, uh, uh, leaving a big mark on how uh, the societies will develop because um, the ones that are left behind will face even a bigger gap in development to catch up with, with their counterparts that have had access to transitioning into um, the digital sphere. Uh, it is also very um, unequal in terms of and women and the small um, and medium enterprises are uh, private business and informal economy are also very much more affected uh, than others. So this is a huge gap, giving, uh, leaving a huge gap uh, to be filled in. Um, another another um, factor is the skill shortages and uh, overall digital and cyber awareness and literacy, something again, relatively new. A lot, we have a lot of online users, uh, social media is thriving um, and apps uh, are thriving, uh, apps market is, is thriving, but in terms of um, cyber awareness, uh, it is still very, a, a big patchwork, uh, even for governments and uh, not only for you, you know, normal users, but governments, uh, I keep getting emails from government agencies from private emails and yahoos right this is um, uh, another case of uh, where you know cyber security and encryption uh, is still something to be uh, becoming a habit for for users in, in the region um, when last year the government of, of Malaysia was changing due to uh, this content of, of handling the pandemic, the news said because it was a, in the peak of pandemic, uh, the news said that uh, the parliamentarians could vote through either email or, or fax or WhatsApp messages. Something that probably in a more secure cyber environment would be probably um, uh, unimaginable. Elena can comment on that to how to what extent uh, that was uh, the case, but I think it's it's a relatively relaxed approach to cybersecurity and encryption and and um, uh, and uses it uh, particularly in terms of of their shift to to embrace online uh, e-commerce and online shopping, which is absolutely thriving. Um, then perhaps paying less attention to the privacy and security of, of e-wallets wallets and um, other online payment. So there is a huge gap in terms of both just digital literacy in general, but also cybersecurity awareness, another very important issue that is uh, going to shape the standards uh, of tech, uh, technology and development, uh, uh, technological development in, in the region. Now, um, I wanted to uh, stress uh, to stress one particular point before um, um, moving to the discussion part is that for while for you know in the bigger picture countries from for example from seen from US uh, and others see tech as another domain a very new and messy domain of competition for Southeast Asian themselves I think it, it is um, an avenue um, an outlook for for economic development. Uh, for development in general, of course, the economic is a very uh, important part of it, but also in development in general, including education, right, public health and other social issues, so that is, cannot be discounted or underplayed. Um, and also, I think it is very important to, to say that um, before Southeast Asian, uh, digital platform, digital transformation and the hope that it carries really is a hope that they hang uh, that post-pandemic recovery. Uh, in all of ASEAN, um, I think that uh, within ASEAN it's very hard to reach any consensus or common ground. Uh, right now, I think the one of the most um, the closest to the common uh, view is, within the region is, is economic recovery from the pandemic and uh, the embrace of digital uh, economy, uh, digital trade and other digitally enabled uh, economic uh, uh, activities because the pandemic has jeopardize the more traditional sectors such as tourism and manufacturing. Uh, a lot of countries are hanging their hope 
on and that digital breakthrough uh, in the uh, that uh, COVID pandemic has induced um, uh, on their economies. So we'll see a huge enthusiasm within ASEAN um, to embrace that. And even this year, Indonesia as a chair of G20 set three top priorities um, of its chairmanship. And one of them is digital transformation um, and next to uh, energy transformation and, and public health. So you can right. see how, how much of that um, is uh, you know, right. important. Right. I'll leave it there, um, not to take too much time uh, for uh, Elena's remark, but happy to engage in on any of those points. Thank Good. You. Very quick, very, very quickly. Uh, I wanted just to make a comment before I pass it to uh, to Elena, uh, and that is this. It seems to me, looking back on what you said, there are a couple of things that occur to me. Um, it seems to me that the topic can be boiled down to three three crucial questions. One is the opportunity, because after all, you know, this technology is alive and well and burgeoning in Southeast Asia, blossoming in Southeast Asia. And I think we should remember that this was not a top-down affair. It wasn't that the governments decided to introduce the technology. You know, I think of Gojek, right, back in 2010, right, which was a call service. You could call and then somebody on a bicycle would come and bring you your dinner. <laughs> That's what, how it began. So it was bottom up, right? It started in the society which maybe is a good thing because then it's harder for governments perhaps to control what is already so deeply embedded in the, you know, in the almost one might say the personal economy, if one, if one can use that phrase, of Southeast Asia. So the opportunity is the first thing, and that's great, that's encouraging. But then we have inequality, which you've referred to, uh, inequality of access, inequality of knowledge and understanding and so forth, inequality between countries, Inequality within countries, those that are left out in some sense, that don't have the access. And then, of course, you've also touched on insecurity, the third issue. Uh, so with that pattern roughly in mind, and without wishing to uh, in any way shape what you're going to say, Elena, I would like to pass it to you. Uh, thanks, Don. I'm going to pick up from your comments about uh, a bottom-up approach. And um, I would say, actually, that the top-down policies of government have complemented very well the bottom-up approach uh, that we've seen in Southeast Asia. And um, also to follow on Hong's earlier points, um, there is this very complex digital landscape of Southeast Asia that I think deserves to be really appreciate it in order to see how uh, complex the decisions have been from amongst policymakers, but also uh, the interest that's been shown by investors, private investors, as well as the enthusiasm by consumers themselves on the ground. So there is this happy trifecta of government, industry, and consumers that have really helped with the burgeoning of the digital landscape in Southeast Asia. And it's what I like to call a patchwork, a pixelated patchwork of partners. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, yeah, the, the, I thought the consonants would be nice as well. But <laughs> anyway, um, so here's what I mean. I, and I think like Hong, I'd like to give a, a, a context to what I'm about to unpack. Um, so in three points, I'm going to provide you with uh, what the digital landscape of Southeast Asia looks like as I see it uh, with this pixelated patchwork of players. And then I'll talk a little bit about the governance frameworks that underpin or doesn't underpin uh, some of this patchwork quilt. Uh, and then I'll finish off by talking about uh, where Southeast Asia stands and its agency and the direction that uh, it should consider heading in given the complexity of this environment. So first of all, the digital landscape of Southeast Asia, Hong has laid it out uh, very well. I just want to complement that by providing you with um, a picture from the three sides, right? From the government side, from the industry side, as well as from the consumer side. So from governments, um, there's what I call this digitalization for development agenda that has produced so many regional and national level policies, strategies, and plans. Um, at the ASEAN level, you have things like the Master Plan on ASEAN Connectivity 2025. You have the ASEAN Consolidated Strategy on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, 
And of course, now you have the ASEAN Digital Ministers Meeting, which uh, is a transformation itself of uh, the, the ASEAN Telecommunications and IT Ministers Meeting. And I think just the renaming of this meeting says a lot about where ASEAN ministers see themselves and how they're trying to position themselves for a more uh, digital picture and environment in the future. And then obviously at the national level, you have um, different initiatives amongst the different countries in Southeast Asia based on their own capacity. So Singapore has its Smart Nation Initiative, Thailand has 4.0, Malaysia has Malaysia 5.0, um, Indonesia has a national AI strategy, and the Philippines um, has a national AI roadmap. So there are all these different acronyms, numbers that go towards this complex landscape in Southeast Asia, but these different policies, plans, and strategies naturally require partners. And so the pixelated patchwork of public and private sector partners to add to the piece from all over the world, I think can be seen most clearly in statements like the East Asia Summit uh, leader statement on ASEAN smart cities, where you have a commitment by 18 governments to be involved in the development of smart cities throughout ASEAN. And these governments are obviously not always aligned with each other, not always thinking in line with each other, and yet they've all committed to help ASEAN develop its smart cities network. That's on the government side of things. On the industry or investment side, again, you have this patchwork of players, right? So for example, you have Microsoft data center regions in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, and Singapore. Singapore alone is home to approximately 50% of Southeast Asia's data center capacity. Um, you have submarine cables that are owned by Facebook and Google, but that are also co-owned by local companies in Southeast Asia, like uh, PT Telcom Indonesia, like Keppel Telecommunications and Transportation, and Excel Axiata. So these are all done in partnership with Southeast Asian champions themselves. And of course, Hong has touched on um, 5G, but now you have, apart from the subsea cables, you also have what's going on in outer space. So we are all used to GPS, but China now has Beidou, uh, the navigation system, and Beidou's satellite navigation system is also used quite extensively throughout Southeast Asia in countries like uh, Laos and Brunei, for example. There are also uh, many, many startups in Southeast Asia. There are about 200 significant startups in Southeast Asia. More than 35 have achieved unicorn status, which means they're valued at more than a billion dollars. Um, and a lot of venture capitalists and bankers say that Southeast Asia and is really sweet. Uh, Southeast Asia is in a really sweet spot right now because it's in a relatively nascent phase tech-wise, but the infrastructure in the region is developed enough for a really strong 400 million internet user base. Mm. And so there's a lot of growth that's expected amongst uh, those willing to fund businesses in Southeast Asia. And then rounding up this trifecta is the enthusiasm and excitement by consumers themselves, right? So 75% of the region's uh, nearly 600 million people are online and 40 million of them started using the internet for the first time between 2020 and 2021, which as we all remember very well, was over the course of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this, policy commitment, the investor interest and in funding, as well as this critical mass of consumers has really mushroomed this digital landscape in Southeast Asia. Um, and the pandemic has only been a catalyst for this tech drive. So second point, what does this all mean for Southeast Asia, right? The so what question. Let me give you three implications. Uh, first, there's an implication for the interoperability of systems and networks and platforms in Southeast Asia. This pixelated patchwork of partners in Southeast Asia means that the tech heterogeneity in Southeast Asia will only become more entrenched. So I talked a little bit about the infrastructure, right? The subsea cables and navigation satellites. Uh, there's also the hardware of surveillance cameras, monitoring systems. Um, there's the e-commerce platforms that are underpinned by companies like Lazada and Grab. 
Uh, there's cloud storage, carrier services, apps that Hong mentioned. These will all have to interact with each other somehow. And the intensification of the US-China tech rivalry right now that is not only happening bilaterally, but also minilaterally through arrangements like AUKUS and the Quad will have ripple effects for Southeast Asian countries that have a diversified portfolio of vendors and suppliers across the region. Um, for the ASEAN region that's actively trying to boost intra-regional connectivity through some of these master plans and policies that I mentioned, having this patchwork of providers means on the one hand, underwriting the security of countries' critical infrastructure, but also on the other hand, it means um, that this very patchwork may be suboptimal in the long run because of harmonization and interoperability challenges. Uh, and I can give you some examples, but just one right now, you know, Indonesia is mulling both 5G and open RAN deployment, radio access network deployment for connectivity. Now, given Indonesia's sheer vastness, right, 17,000 islands and its topography across these 17,000 islands, having both 5G and an open RAN uh, deployment makes sense. 5G would be for more dense urban areas, open RAN would be for more rural areas across the archipelago. Now, Indonesia and Huawei are exploring a collaboration in 5G and other um, high-tech developments but Huawei is not a member of Open RAN. And so if Huawei is selected as a 5G core provider uh, by Indonesia, and it were to deploy this 5G technology in urban areas, while Open RAN is deployed in rural areas, there are questions about the interoperability of these systems, uh, given that Huawei is not a member of Open RAN um, in, in Indonesia. Related to that, um, Open RAN's technical work is overseen by um, the ORAN Alliance rather than 3GPP, which is a collaboration on technical standards between 200 plus countries, vendors, academics, and, and other players, which relates to the second implication for Southeast Asia, which is this idea of governance frameworks that includes technical standards and norms of responsible state behavior and cyberspace, ethical principles of AI and application of international law in, in cyberspace. Now, these have all become arenas for geopolitical contestation with jostling for leadership and greater membership of these very standards organizations, as well as what I call thought tussling at international forums such as the UN. Um, and this concern about standards, norms, principles, laws becoming a, an arena for geopolitical contestation is not altogether unwarranted. China's standardization administration explicitly aspires to formulate at least a thousand systematic plans uh, and tasks to create foreign language versions of Chinese standards and uh, strive to reach 2000 key technical indicators in areas of standardization. You also see some of these debates uh, that turn ideological uh, at the UN with uh, cyber norms, for example. I'm happy to go into that later on. Uh, but I also want to touch on a third implication for Southeast Asia. And this idea and argument of values promotion through technology, through the standards that are pushed out, through the norms that are broadcasted and advocated, and through some of the principles and even laws that are pushed through. This idea of values promotion, uh, largely advocated by the West, uh, the US and its allies, I think is less convincing given Southeast Asia's own historical experiences with democracy promotion, uh, particularly during the Cold War. Um, and so I think this argument of values through standards, for example, holds less credence and credibility in Southeast Asia's eyes. And Hong has already talked about how uh, some of the decisions, many of the decisions in Southeast Asia have been driven by pragmatism more than principle per se. Now, finally, my final point is on Southeast Asia's uh, leverage and agency for its own digital future or futures as the case may be. Uh, one of my favorite points to make regarding this is that today, two thirds of the global population lives in Asia. China and India obviously account for the bulk of that figure, 
But let's not forget that Indonesia, the largest country in ASEAN, is the world's fourth most populous nation. And by 2100, by the turn of the century, 90% of the people on the planet are expected to live outside Europe and North America. And so if most of the people living in the world will live in the global South, including in Southeast Asia, then shouldn't this region, Southeast Asia, have an equitable say in how technology will change their lives and how the governance structures of technology, the norms and rules and frameworks should reflect the perspectives, expectations and value systems of this population. Um, I think there are two issues to unpack very quickly. One is Southeast Asian countries' relations to uh, the powerful private tech players. And two, obviously, the country's relationship with powerful governments um, that housed many of these powerful private tech players. There's obviously a power inequity here. And um, how Southeast Asia chooses to navigate between these different types of challenges with the private sector and with governments um, is something that Southeast Asia is trying to figure out for itself. One concrete example um, on norms of uh, state behavior, responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Southeast Asia, the ASEAN region was the first regional grouping in the world to sign on to um, these norms in principle in 2015. And it's now working to implement those norms. But my belief is that Southeast Asians will really need to dig deeper and to understand how these norms translate into practice, uh, not only for the current day operations of um, small and medium enterprises in the region, but also how it will affect the unborn and the underserved right now in the future. And this means really having an understanding of what norms mean in a regional context, even in a national context within Southeast Asia. And this gets to some of the deeper uh, understandings of history, the history of technology in Southeast Asia, as well as how this arc of history will play out in the future. Let me stop here. Uh, I know there's a lot to discuss and I'd be happy to be a part of this conversation um, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. I really appreciate that. You really covered, uh, covered the waterfront, as we say. And before we open it up to the Q&A from the attendees, if you don't mind, I wonder if I could um, ask you a question or just raise my reaction to, to what you said. Um, first of all, there's a very technical question as the extent to which hardware affects software. In other words, you know, I'm starting from uh, obviously uh, <laughs> a lack of uh, information about the technicalities here. Um, would it be fair to say that if Huawei dominates the hardware, hard, the, the software will, will then be dominated also by Huawei because it comes with the hardware? Or is it possible to imagine, I mean, after all, this, this is a very creative field, uh, that interoptability, which is the, the point I think that, um, that Hung was focusing on particularly, will be achievable through technical arrangements that will allow one to transform uh, and read messages sent in one system to messages received in a different system, right? Or will the first system, whether it's China's or some other country's system, block that from happening? so that you get, get bubbles inside Southeast Asia, depending upon where you have open RAN, RAN whether you have you know, 5G or some other variation that is not compatible with these other uh, bubbles, if you will. Um, I wonder if you could comment on that. I just, I lack the technical information that I need to be able to answer that question. Did you get the, uh, are you there? Yes, sir. Sorry, Alina, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't know if, because you mentioned Hong, so I didn't know if you wanted her to comment first. No, 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 I want you to comment if, if I could. Okay. Uh, so I too like the precise technical expertise to comment on this in great detail. 
But I think there are interoperability challenges uh, because many of these systems are sold, marketed, and pitched as a whole package. Right. Um, and so, for example, uh, I'll use the UK, right? Um, the UK decided that it would no longer um, need or, or require Huawei to be a part of its 5G system because it would be incapable of communicating with the US based on the US's technical specifications. Now, if something like that were to be transposed to a Southeast Asian economy, you can see how that would present some clear challenges to the Southeast Asian country itself. Right now, I think what we're also seeing is a mixture of what is happening on the ground with hardware, but also with some of the cloud service providers. So there is a government-led initiative in many Southeast Asian countries to move everything to cloud storage. And the cloud storage uh, service is dominated by US companies, Microsoft, um, Amazon. Uh -huh. um, but if some of the hardware infrastructure is being provided by, uh, let's say a Chinese company, um, that may or may not present interoperability challenges depending on what arrangements are worked out at the contractual level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, thank you. All right, uh, I've got lots mm -hmm. of other questions, but let, let me pick a couple up uh, from the, uh, from the Q&A. Um, uh, don't uh, can I jump, jump in just, just to oh, add? Sure, yes, absolutely, absolutely, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. On that. Also, um, I had a different conversation with the technical experts on that and, and in specific context of Huawei and 5G, when, you know, like, like Elena said, um, perhaps the software uh, is chosen either in partnership with a homegrown and an external, you know, most of the cases where European uh, providers, uh, but the phone uh, or, you know, the, the hardware equipment or the tower provided are still built by Huawei, right? Then, then, then I think that is a very porous system. Um, and then one, that's why I think uh, that was one of arguments that the Southeast Asian um, used to, to uh, discard that Huawei ban because, first of all, they said, you know, Huawei was involved in, in 2G, 3G, 4G building, in, involving the infrastructure and uh, uh, hardware and, and software. So is there much point in, in um, banning it from 5G? Of course, there would be, but there, that, that is, uh, I think there is no completely secure uh, environment that we have to start with this acknowledgement in the first place. And, and then uh, that interplay between the hardware and, and software is another um, loophole to, to leave it there. I think uh, notably uh, the former prime minister of Malaysia, Mahathir, did say, uh, did say that in one of the conference, uh, I think it was Nikkei, uh, specifically about Huawei and 5G that, you know, um, if any of major powers want to know about any country they know already. So what is the really a point of value Huawei or not? But but there is um, there will be this like usual, you know there are considerations on the national security levels and government, uh, which will present uh, interoperability issues and trust as well. Like we, we were talking about different ecosystem uh, uh, um, and the fear that there will be a technological iron curtain happening, but on the user and population level, people can can use perhaps Nokia as a 5G network provider, but with their Huawei phones, which are really pro, mm -hmm. uh, uh, very, very popular in the Southeast Asian markets as well as the Europeans as well. Right. Well, actually, maybe I could follow up with another question. Uh, if I could, because the agreement was we'd have a bit more conversation before we get to the Q&A. Um, so here's my question. Is there any evidence in Southeast Asia of the beginning of the surveillance that is associated with China's social credit system? Where your phone essentially uh, <laughs> uh, enables, uh, in the Chinese case, the government to give you points uh, and if you jaywalk, for example, you ignore the red light if you're walking across the street, then maybe you get a point. And if you get a certain number of points, then you find that, you know, you can no longer buy an airline ticket, you know, to fly to either in-country or to Tokyo or somewhere else. Or you are otherwise hampered when you go to the grocery store to try to go shopping. Now, that's from an American perspective, you know, we live in a fairly individualist country here. Uh, that's really unthinkable. 
but it strikes me as thinkable perhaps in Southeast Asia. Is there any evidence that there are steps being? I think of, for example, you mentioned smart nation, uh, Alina, uh, and also smart city. Are smart cities being developed in Southeast Asia that will provide the capacity for this kind of digital surveillance? My knowledge, there hasn't been a deep consideration of the social credit system in Southeast Asia, um, who may have information otherwise, but the surveillance systems are already in place in, in many smart cities across Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the fact that there hasn't been much discussion about some of the security implications is just a lack of awareness. And a part of it is just uh, that people accept the risks that come with some of the uh, public safety concerns um, that seem to top uh, some of these privacy and security concerns otherwise. Yeah. I wonder if you would I go so I wonder if you'd go so far as to as to say that in Southeast Asia, the individualism that we find in the United States is missing. Uh, it's it's not there. Uh, that's of course an exaggeration. To some extent, it probably is there. But that the communitarianism of Southeast Asia will mean that by and large, Southeast Asians will be, how can I put it, less reluctant to take part in digital networks where they know that the government has access to their personal information. Uh, and, and you know, then you can develop, I suppose, a cultural explanation behind that, which gets a little tricky because some of the countries in Southeast Asia are incredibly diverse uh, in cultural terms, right? I mean, a Javanese uh, and a Batak uh, from Sumatra, they're, they're, they're not the same. Uh, but I wonder, does that argument make any sense so that the Americans who worry about this uh, should just remember their anthropology and say, well, you know, there's different cultures, different strokes for different folks. What do you think? Uh, before I go into that culture uh, argument, <laughs> but can I respect your question about surveillance? I think, of course, surveillance is happening fast paced and big time and it's so, in Southeast Asia, like in the world, and really through the pandemic, we, we've seen that um, overflowing, really. Um, I think uh, Philippines is an interesting case uh, where the surveillance system, um, where Filipino go government of Duterte in particular was very embracing the, uh, the providers of Chinese telecom the telecommunication companies with um, surveillance system and facial recognition and others because it just it just aligned with his war on drugs and cleaning the streets um, policies um, and of course it, you know China has played arguably a, a big role in that and with you know, 29, 30 or more agreements in, in the uh, that Xi Jinping, when he visited the Philippines, signed with, with Duterte to contribute to that safe Philippine project. Of, uh, and, and that would contract Huawei and other Chinese telecommunication companies and to construct and provide camera surveillance across uh, the metropolitans there. Uh, and I think throughout the pandemic, uh, the trend has been, of course, not only in the Philippines, but uh, globally really strengthening. I think it's it's ultimately, it's not just about state and it's about tech companies as actors themselves, because uh, as users, we do compromise, uh, you know, for the sake of convenience, compromise our data. And that has been very, very prevalent with uh, e-banking, online finances, and, and more recently health, App, right? we, we provide all our individual data and they go to the individual apps providers, private companies, but as well as, as the government agencies, either provincial or, 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 or uh, federal in terms of uh, how COVID was monitored, right? Um, so I don't think that is particularly different for Southeast Asia, that is the same case of, you know, uh, to different level of awareness to how, what extent they are providing the individual data and to what extent the compromise is there. I think for Vietnam, uh, who, you know, we, we would think a, 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 a more controlling state, it was always an um, impression for me that it's, it's much more free than many of developed countries where the surveillance system and control system or even banking system was much more developed, for example, right? Like individuals could not be fined for speeding because they didn't have necessarily bank account uh, and stuff like that. But in developed countries, uh, in Singapore, I would never dare to uh, speed uh, uh, 
excessive speed, for example, because I know that the, 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 the bill will come uh, exactly to my address. So things like that, you know, um, and, and I think with a specific, um, and it's, you know, even in Australia, even with um, with the social credit, I'm sure countries are, uh, are studying very closely, but I haven't seen um, that uh, applied yet. Uh, I think it is just requires too much, uh, much more uh, yeah. level of, of surveillance than currently there is within Southeast Asia. Like if you look at the most surveilled cities, top 20 to 30, most of them are in China, right? And with some few in, in, in London, it was one of them, or a few in, in India, but not really just yet in Southeast Asia. So to reach that level, you have to have penetration across different levels of life. The, the, the level uh, that most of Southeast Asia has not yet reached. And I think there would be quite a pushback um, for applying that. So I think we're probably still a long way to, to see that um, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Galina, if, if you want to answer that as well, but uh, before I turn it over to you, let me give you a question from one of the attendees, which is a very important question, I suppose really pretty basic. And that is this, as the transformation, digital transformation of Southeast Asia proceeds, are we going to get unemployment as a result of automation? Is that going to be a problem? Or maybe it already is. That's the question for Elena. Uh, and Elena, if you want to comment on the question that we were just talking about, about surveillance, feel free. Then I'll go back to you later, Hong. Yeah, so just on surveillance, I think we often think of surveillance as a new phenomenon that uh, Chinese technologies have brought to bear, but you know, I think history has taught us that that's not the case. You know? right, right, Chinese right. are simply new, newer entrants to this field, and uh, Snowden's uh, exploits have only shown that uh, this is a much longer um, phenomenon than we care to remember. So, uh, you know, sometimes memories are short, but I think it's well worth remembering that it's not just government. Um, governments that are uh, that are guilty of this. It's also private sector collusion with governments, right? And uh, you know, right. American companies have long made their mark in Southeast Asia. Microsoft has been in the region for nearly thirty years, but uh, these companies are also not immune to being strong armed by their governments to surveil. Um, foreign populations, i.e. non-US citizens. And uh, I think many Southeast Asians have been on the receiving end of this. It's just that we sometimes uh, don't really think of the bigger picture when we talk about surveillance. Um, on automation, yes, there is obviously a risk of uh, job loss, particularly for lower skilled workers in Southeast Asia. And that's why there is um, a lot of initiatives that are being conducted to upskill many of these workers in Southeast Asia. That's proven to be a challenge because obviously it's a longer term initiative, both educating and vocationally training and reskilling many of these workers in Southeast Asia. But I think uh, there have been a number of studies that show that for the highest skilled workers, that human touch will still be warranted. And the risk of job loss through automation is not all that it's cracked up to be or the dangers and risks of such job loss um, can be mitigated if governments proceed with their policy planning in a wise fashion. Okay, all right. Okay, good. Um, another question from uh, the audience. Um, at some point, uh, won't tech companies in Southeast Asia, or tech entrepreneurs, if you will, demand reciprocal access to the heavily restricted Chinese digital market? Could this become an issue? Either one would be happy to answer, I hope. Either one, Hong or Elena? In other words, the, the image here is that China's digital market is, is controlled. Uh, and in Southeast Asia, surely the tech entrepreneurs would like to break into that market. I'm not quite sure what it means to say that China's digital market is controlled though. 
Um, but would either of you respond? In other words, is there inequality between what China can do uh, with data compared to what Southeast Asians can do with data? And do Southeast Asians want to correct that difference? I've spoken a lot, but uh, I want to give Hong the chance and I'll take a crack at it um, after Hong goes. Okay, Hong? Um, yeah, I haven't seen that much uh, of a conversation now, uh, you know, um, perhaps this is, it, it is the reason why, uh, but I think, it, you know, it's not just um, the regulation environment and, and restrictive access with um, Chinese law, but also individual Southeast Asian countries have their own uh, restrictions uh, themselves in by you know conservative cybersecurity law themselves as well. So yes, of course, China would Chinese big tech would have certain uh, advantages as as big tech would, whether Chinese or any other country or multinationals, over um, uh, uh, in the negotiation. But um, I don't I don't think it's it's straightforward one way. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, we, we yet to, um, we're talking about how blossoming Southeast Asian as, um, tech ecosystem is, but um, there are still, you know, in terms of scale, there are, there's a still a lot of way for them, for the tech companies there to, to be become on, on par with, you know, let's say Tencent and Krupp or Alibaba. So there, there is this in, inherent in, imbalance there. In terms of access, I think it's um, there's still an, on a political level. So that's why it is important for, for South Asian countries to have positive or uh, as, as positive as possible relationship with the government. Because at that point, if you, I understand your question correctly, it's, it's a very top down still approach. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Yeah, these are some of these questions are rather imponderable. I mean, the real issue here is the Great Firewall, right? Uh, and the ability of China to censor messages that circulate internally inside China. And then I suppose the issue would become insofar as China matters so much economically in Southeast Asia, uh, not to mention the power that China might have, you know, to uh, impress upon the Southeast Asians uh, that they should not say bad things about China that that censorship will spread beyond. In fact, to some extent, I think it already has spread beyond China into Southeast Asia. But that's a matter of politics and power, uh, autocratic versus democratic. I'm not sure to what extent that's a, that's a, technological, uh, that's a technological question. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, there is uh, another question here. Um, uh, focusing again on the US-China tech uh, competition. Um, and that has to do with how the different governments, and I would add the businesses in Southeast Asia, uh, are shaping their policy toward data governance. You know, how you handle data, this gets at issues particularly of censorship and self-censorship, both domestically and regionally. For example, is there any effort in Southeast Asia, this is my addition, uh, to generate what some might consider to be a censorship program for the region. I mean, I can imagine, for example, eventually this happening under ASEAN auspices. And in that context, uh, particularly since you have discussed ASEAN's activity, a whole series of initiatives, and I, without wanting to sound too cynical, that's characteristic of ASEAN plans and uh, you know, uh, this, you know, with dates attached to them, you know, 2025 or whatever, uh, with all of that activity, do you think that ASEAN is going to establish what one might call a kind of a regime of rules for the road, right? Rules for the digital road, perhaps connected to the digital Silk Road, in that we haven't talked about the implications of China's economic penetration of the region uh, with regard to the digital aspect. Do you see any prospects there? So there are a couple of questions that are mixed up, and if you wanted to pick one of them, that would be great, or both. Either one of you. Alina, you want to take that on and then for Hong, or how do you want to? Sure, I'll, I'll uh, go with the question on data governance. I think that there are many Southeast Asian countries that have already begun to formulate or are in the process of drafting 
uh, data, some form of data governance law, whether it's data protection or data privacy. There are many countries in Southeast Asia that already have personal data uh, uh, protection laws in place. Um, and ASEAN as a region has what is called a data management framework that has good practices um, that tries to secure and protect the data that flows through the economies in order to facilitate largely trade. And so a lot of the data governance initiatives are trade driven. Um, they're meant to make easy some of these cross-border data flows. There are some um, holdouts in, in the ASEAN, amongst the ASEAN economies. Um, Vietnam and Indonesia are often identified as uh, trending towards data localization laws. And there is a bit of a paradox there since Vietnam is part of the CPTPP, which has a more liberal uh, data governance regime. And I think Vietnam is trying to work out some of those challenges internally. But the fact that Vietnam has already uh, committed to the CPTPP shows that it is very aware of some of these uh, issues and is trying to work through them. Uh, but I think actually Southeast Asia's data governance inclinations have shown to be more towards uh, the GDPR, Europe's GDPR, which is uh, really quite protective of uh, personal data in particular, but uh, rather liberal in terms of some of the business related data in order to facilitate and ease trade. So there is a, a paradox of sorts uh, in what's going on in Southeast Asia, but uh, stay tuned uh, for more plans and policies, I guess. Okay. Mahongi, you uh, want to comment or shall I go on? Yes, a quick comment on, on ASEAN efforts. Um, uh, yes, there is that, uh, that ASEAN framework for data management. But when I think Elena's right that it's uh, it's going to be general um, because when it comes to data, which is you know if it's take, if it's treated as strategic resource, um, then it is also a matter of of national interest and national security. And then it, if it's even you know we're talking about national uh, issues like digital so sovereignty, then immediately there will be of course uh, what kind of follows that in ASEAN, which is non interference. <laughs> And, and that would be very, and you know, the picture as we both laid out to you is a very uneven within South, Southeast Asian uh, individual countries. So it'd be very difficult to have a, you know, very standardized uh, uh, platform uh, if, it, if it's very, it's not very general. So that's the first point. It, it's going to be challenging because, you know, that digital sovereignty in, in the borderless environment is going to be a, a totally different game. But uh, I think, um, you know, there are aspects of that that can be shaped, including, uh, Elena mentioned CPTPP, but also RCEP that is more East Asian, um, that includes China, Japan, and uh, Korea, and uh, Australia, and New Zealand, except for India. But, um, uh, but there is huge chapter and hope towards digital trade there and also standards of IP there. Uh, it is always going to be uh, leaning towards the lowest common denominators there in terms of standards, just because that's only way to carry everyone uh, together uh, without, uh, you know, if, if, if it's such a um, in such a group where the mature maturity and the maturity and all the um, aspects are so diverse. Now, I wanted to make a point on um, digital zero don um, and and more of the China's influence in Southeast Asia. Like I said in the opening remark, China's influence will be very entrenched, regardless if uh, you know they choose one technology uh, over another or or, you know, shy away from one company uh, other uh, than others. Because what China does is really integrate on multiple level, almost every level. And we're talking about uh, infrastructure from bridges and roads, but also infrastructure like uh, station, uh, network stations and stuff like that. So, you know, they, they will be there regardless if you use the software or not. That's one thing. Another thing is, um, you know, digital trade free zone that China often partners 
with individual countries. For example, it has such partnership with, with Malaysia uh, to work um, uh, on the digital free trade zone and help uh, you know small and medium enterprises to develop. China also partners with digital um, economic uh, cooperation to boost international e-commerce. Uh, and you know, for for countries, they are receptive of those partnerships and investment because they want to be competitive and they want to go ahead also with the peers, which is our fellow Southeast Asian uh, markets as well. Um, Chinese. Uh, e-wallet services are prevailing across Southeast Asia. So I think in the long term, um, it, like we said, it's gonna be a very mixed picture of, um, uh, uh, of uh, and, and China, again, China also invest in trainings. Before um, Jack Ma disappeared, he was you know, touring Southeast Asia with Alibaba's uh, groups offering trainings, startup incubators, uh, there are a lot of programs active or had been at least active before um, uh, Jack Ma's uh, political issues, uh, but they've been there and they are there and they are very active in Southeast Asia. So it's, it's certainly not one thing. Um, and I don't think China will ever, or Chinese tech companies will uh, ever be uh, marginalized in, in Southeast Asia. So this is a very important uh, gateway for, for, for China. Yeah. Good. So priority market there. There are a lot of other things that we could discuss. Let me just pick one or two. We, we technically can keep going a little longer. Um, okay, so uh, one approach to this topic would be to ask the question, what other sectors of life, uh, not just the economy, uh, are affected by technology and how are they affected? Um, and, you know, just a couple of thoughts here. You can ignore one or both of them. You don't have to answer either one. Um, uh, the first one is education. Obviously, I happen to work in a university, so needless to say, and both of you are scholars, you have higher degrees, so obviously uh, that's a no-brainer, so to speak. Uh, we, 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 we really should ask how the technology is impacting, for better or for worse, education. Uh, both the extent, access to education, but also the quality of education. And uh, we have to factor in COVID-19, of course, and what I take to be, at least that's the case here in the U.S., the proliferation of, of Zoom arrangements uh, so that you don't have in-person learning. And then the question is, does the lack of in-person learning actually stunt the developing mind that a child has, to put it really brutally, uh, or not? Uh, so are we going to have a generation that's going to emerge in Southeast Asia, for, for that matter, in other countries, perhaps even including the United States, um, that is not as, as educationally trained uh, as they would have been in the absence of uh, COVID-19? Um, so I guess in that context, you know, the, the technology is there and you might want to comment on it. And, and, and obviously there are arguments in favor of, I mean, one of the things about technology that's amazed me that when I do a webinar, um, you know, there are more than 100 people attending this webinar. I'm not sure how many of them are still with us, but <laughs> uh, anyway, 100 uh, signed up. Uh, and uh, I have been on webinars where the number is not 100. Uh, the number is in the thousands. And so the opportunity to reach large numbers of people for an educational purpose, perhaps kids that are out in the boondocks that, uh, you know, can't, can't afford tuition a long way from a, from a school. I mean, that would be you know, as I said at the beginning, that's an opportunity that one might relate to technology. Um, and then the other thing, if you don't mind my saying this, this is a, raising a rather sensitive subject, which is the rights uh, and opportunities of women. Uh, and of course, Southeast Asia is very diverse, so I'm not treating it as a single block by any means. But would it be fair to suggest that in the distribution of access uh, to the technology, women by and large, in Southeast Asia are uh, less able to access the technology uh, compared to men. Uh, now that would depend, of course, on the relationship between you know, male and female in a particular culture in a particular country, don't misunderstand. But I wonder if either of you feel that one of the inequalities, we've talked about a number of them, uh, involves gender with regard to technology. So they're just two, two questions, toss them out and you can ignore them or answer them, either one. Helena, you wanna try or, or 
If you're not interested, that's fine. <laughs> no, I, I think there is a basic issue of digital access. Um, and this has been highlighted by the pandemic. So there have been a number of anecdotal stories uh, in, in my country, in Malaysia, but also in other parts of Southeast Asia, where lockdowns that have forced students um, to rely on the internet have been particularly challenging for a number of these students because they haven't been able to gain um, sustained access, good access to some of their classes online. You know, there was one story that was publicized in the newspapers in Malaysia about this one girl, a teenager, who had to climb up a tree to be able to get a Wi-Fi signal in order for her to take her exam online. Wow. And unfortunately, given, again, the terrain topography of some countries in Southeast Asia, access remains a real challenge. And that's why, as we mentioned, a digital divide in Southeast Asia is very real and very problematic. Because as you mentioned, Don, right, thinking about educating a whole generation for the future in Southeast Asia, if this requires um, you know, reliable access, then really there has to be some serious capital expenditure, operational expenditure, in some of the infrastructure that will sustain that kind of internet access um, in order to educate the next generation. Right. Absolutely, well said. Hong, do you want to comment or? Yes, yeah, so John, the, the report uh, you mentioned in the introductory remarks that I recently just called also is one of the key and first and more foremost and more urgent recommendation is actually uh, of course, education, skilling, training, reskilling, and upskilling, and primarily uh, uh, women and, and girls, um, because of uh, the pandemic has disproportionately affected women. Most of job loss are the ones of, of women. Of course, in Southeast Asia, we have big informal economy sector, which are traditionally dominated by women. So the loss of income is disproportionately larger on, on women. Um, as the, uh, as a, in, in their economic activities. Now, in terms of education, um, I think, of course, it's also disproportion, traditional disproportion of women, of girls in STEM. Uh, so that's also already setting a little bit of disadvantage for them. So it, it's really utmost uh, priority for Southeast Asian countries to take, if they are one of the, this digital transformation to be successful, it is a really investing in training and education and um, especially women and girls. Now, I think education you mentioned is very important that just because for many developing countries, education is the way out, right? isn't it? It is to break the, mm -hmm. the poverty circle. But the problem is when uh, a lot of uh, countries transition to the online teaching and learning, like Elena said, many cases where students couldn't from remote areas particularly couldn't access or it was just too expensive to access internet but there are also cases where teachers in remote schools don't have private computers don't can't equally access internet and um, so it's going to be a, you know the impact of this it's going to be really devastating for years to come so um, governments need to have it uh, thought through how to really mitigate that because um, you know we are uh, going to, to potentially see a lot of people falling behind the poverty line and countries falling behind in their development goals and education is one of the sectors that will be mostly hit and if it's for younger um, age education this is really a huge disadvantage they have. Yeah, right. Don, if I could just jump in really quickly on this issue of women. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So I think it's really important to have women participate not only in technologies that have already been designed and developed, but also include them in the conceptualization uh, stage of some of these technologies. Because, you know, 50% mm -hmm. of the world's population is comprised of women. And mm -hmm. if we exclude that 50% mm -hmm. from the design of technology, mm -hmm. we're excluding mm -hmm. half the world mm -hmm. and how those mm -hmm. uh, technologies are deployed, conceptualized uh, and used will reflect on only one part of the world's population. 
Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about bias and uh, discriminatory designs of technologies, particularly with algorithms. Um, having women being involved from the get go, not just women, but also underrepresented communities, you know, whether of color, of ethnicity, of religion, is also going to be really important in how uh, some of these AI systems are used and deployed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I think we'll call it a call it a day. Thank you so much for uh, your input, your remarks, your comments. I, I learned a lot. I'm sure the attendees did as well. And uh, let me just say on a closing note that um, uh, it's always good to be optimistic, optimistic at the end. <laughs> that I very much hope that the pixelated patchwork of players and partners will transform Southeast Asia in the right direction. So how about that to end on? <laughs> Thank you again, both uh, Elena and Hong. Thank you so very much, really appreciate it. I wish you the best and thank you to the audience as well for persevering to the end. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. take care, all the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>